I'm here today with Dr. Betty Priest. Betty recently authored a book titled The Space Between Us, Conversations About Transforming Conflict from Harold Press. With over 28 years of experience coaching, mediating, training, facilitating, and consulting, Betty is highly regarded as a conflict change and leadership specialist. Betty's a specialist in equity, diversity, inclusion, leading anti-racism, anti-prejudice workshops, coaching leaders, and offering support to organizations wrestling with EDI challenges. Betty has extensive education, training, and experience in coaching, mediation, negotiation, consensus building, and consultation, facilitation, and organizational health. She's co-founder and CEO of Credence, an innovative industry leader in organizational health, conflict transformation, and change management. Betty has a PhD from Free University Amsterdam on conflict transformation. She is a chartered mediator with the ADR Institute of Canada and a member of the ADR Institute of Ontario. She's a regular instructor at the University of Waterloo, and you can learn more about Betty and her work at bettyprees.ca. That's B-E-T-T-Y-P-R-I-E-S dot C-A. So Betty, it's uh, quite an honor to uh, have you join us today. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. It's good to be here. So um, before we get into your books, can you tell us more about your background? You've done a lot of really interesting work. Okay, where to start? I, I sometimes I think, sometimes when people ask me how I got into my work, I say that my profession chose me, I didn't choose it. Um, I was carpooling with somebody way back when I lived in Winnipeg, um, back in 1993, and his wife ran the local mediation center. Um, and they were looking for someone that they thought was teachable. Um, because at that point in history, there was no real academic program to get into this field. And so they hired me, they trained me, and uh, I've been in the field ever since. I've done all my subsequent degrees. I've done sort of on the side as I've been working full time in this work. So it's been a it's been a great, um, great career, not without its challenges. Um, but it's been a real privilege to do this work. Absolutely. And so do you do most of your work with um, companies or individuals or how does that all work? Sure. I, I divide my time. Um, so part of my work is with organizations uh, like municipalities, schools, hospitals. I do a lot of work in universities, um, some in social services, in private businesses. So the whole workplace world. And then I do a significant amount of work in the church world as well. So congregations and faith-based organizations and then just regular organizations. So that's the that's sort of the landscape in which I do my work. I mean, people do conflict and communication work in lots of different contexts. Our organization really specializes in organizations, whether those be churches or workplaces. Um, and that's where we do our work, yeah. And most of the sessions, most of the work, is it is it, you know, equity and diversity related or is it just general conflict management or is it just kind of very all over? It is all over. It really depends. Um, we've been we've been doing equity work for a long time, but since 2020, that really picked up, right? So um, there was a notable shift uh, in May of nine, of 2020 when people started calling kind of nonstop for our equity work. But at the same time, we've had since the beginning of the pandemic, we've had nonstop calls on how do we support groups through polarized conversations which mm -hmm. is similar to equity work but actually different because a lot mm -hmm. of that's coming from in the faith-based sector around dealing with masks closing buildings and you know, keeping them open all that kind of stuff um so those are polarized conversations equity work conflict and communication and then just plain old leadership like how what does it mean to be a leader what does it mean to lead these people um in this context in this mm -hmm. time in this space mm -hmm. Uh, so um, a lot of our work has, I mean, it feels like the work changes depending on the season that we're in, but a lot of our work with organizations has been how to help organizations through change, mm. um, whether it's growth or shrinking. Both of those are extreme. Growth is as hard as, as contraction, uh, differently hard, but also hard. And so helping organizations manage growth, manage change, manage conflict, manage really the human dimension of what it means to be together as people. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I'm sure you encounter a lot of very interesting situations and dynamics. So that's got to make it, uh, you know, not boring. <laughs> that, that, it's never boring. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's get into the book. I mentioned that the title is The Space Between Us, Conversations About Transforming Conflict. So what motivated you to write that book? 
Sure. So, I mean, I had been asked. People, workshop participants would say, do you have a book? Do you have a book? So there were requests coming. But what really uh, motivated me is in 2019, I defended a thesis, a PhD thesis. Um, and uh, the people were really interested in it. And it's pretty academic. Um, in order to, you know, the average person would find it a bit of a slog to read through. It's, I think it's interesting. But it, it was written for an academic context. And I wanted to take some of the conclusions from the book and translate them into a, a more readable context, put it that way, a more accessible context. Uh, that would be one way of describing why the book is written. The other reason I think I wrote the book and the reason I did the thesis is because I have been practicing contemplative spirituality since, oh my goodness, 1995 or six. I've been a mediator since 1993. So those, my professional discipline as a mediator and my personal spirituality as a contemplative, those two really found their roots at a similar time in my life. And I have continued to do both of things through my life. And I have found such intersection between these two disciplines or two ways of being, I guess, that I wanted to, um, I wanted to explore that richness with more depth. And that's what led to the thesis, which led to the book. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about that intersection more. Can you dive into that concept um, a, l- a little bit? Sure. Um, so, contemplative spirituality um, goes by many names. You know, in this in the in the world at large, it's often known as mindfulness. Um, in the faith based world, it's sometimes known, in the Christian faith based world, it's sometimes known as contemplative spirituality, but in my experience, when I, um, let me maybe start from the world of conflict. Uh, in the world of conflict, uh, I, can, I can work at resolution. Well, hmm, let me take a step back again. <laughs> um, what I noticed in dealing with conflict is I could be brilliant as a mediator or not, but how effective the resolution between the parties was had something to do with my skill set, but had a lot to do with how they came to the table. And how they came to to the table had a lot to do with their inner stuff and their inner transformation. And those people who had done some significant inner healing work were much more effective in the mediation room than those who had not. And in, in the world of equity, diversity, inclusion, we talk a lot about system changes. And that's a really important thing. But we're not gonna change any systems if we're not changing any hearts. We're not going to change any hearts if we're not changing any systems. And so these two are always in dance with one another. And then I observed in all of the literature I'd read about conflict was all about how to, you know, work with the people when they're together and, you know, how to, those are good skills to have. But I didn't see a lot on the intersection between what is happening in my inner spirit and how can I be profoundly grounded in the presence of somebody who's kind of unmooring me. And what would it be like to show up really grounded in the presence of someone who's unmooring me? And how would that influence the conversation? And more and more, I've come to the conclusion, the more we can transform ourselves, the more we can show up to the other in a way that's transformative for our relationship. Um, And then for the system as a whole as well. And so, and then, okay, so you could go to therapy. Therapy's good. I'm not, you know, there's lots of good things in therapy. Contemplative spirituality takes us to a slightly different place. It pulls us into grounding in a much, well, it, it, for me at least, contemplative spirituality has allowed me to access a kind of a grounding um, that allows me to stay moored in the context of stormy waters, which allows me to show up in hard conversations more effectively. Interesting, interesting. So the transformation of self that you refer to is kind of an achievement of that internal mooring. Is that, how, how would you describe the transformation that people often need to go through? I know every situation, every individual is different, but can you describe that a little bit, you know, yeah, generally? Sure. That's a, yeah, that's a really helpful question. So I would say it like this. So let's pretend you and I are having a conflict. Uh, I could focus all my energies on how you need to change. <laughs> That's not going to work very well. The more that you hear me trying to change you, the more you're likely to be resistant. The more that I can focus on transferring myself and showing up really well to you, it may cause you to change or not. But at the end of the day, my integrity is still intact. 
and I have shown up to the best of my ability to this relationship with you. That would be one way of thinking about it. Another way of thinking about it is um, whenever we enter times of suffering, and conflict is a time of suffering for us. Um, and let me just say, conflict in my mind is different from disagreement. You know, a really raucous disagreement um, is, is wonderful. It's when it turns personal. When our, when, and when something from disagreement turns from disagreement into conflict, we experience our selfhood as being at risk. And when we experience our selfhood as being at risk, we have to defend to keep alive, right? We have to defend ourselves to stay alive. And once I'm defending myself to stay alive, you're the problem. I'm the solution. Like, you're the problem. Solving you is the solution. And I just, I'm fine. I'm fine. Contemplative spirituality says not so fast. You know, there's a piece that you're invited to pay attention to. How are you contributing to this? Even if I have been, even if I haven't said anything negatively to you, how are my attachments contributing to this? How are my, you know, you know, what's, what's the right way of dealing with the conflict with one person could be the wrong way with the next person. So how am I being invited to show up well to you, the person who's in front of me, hmm. or even to just show up well for myself? Those are hard questions to answer. But in my experience, when we go into that kind of silent spaces of contemplative practice, we start to let go of our attachments. We start to let go of it has to be my way. We start to see ourselves in the way that God sees us as beloved. Mm. We allow our, we allow to, ourselves to see ourselves through the lens of compassion. And when I can be compassionate to myself, including for all the ways that I've messed up, I'm more likely to be compassionate to you. If I could just add this yet, you know what, when I would say that one of the big, big barriers to healthy conflict resolution I encounter is that the vast majority of us are suffering from significant low self, significantly low levels of self-esteem here in North America. Mm. And so we are fighting the other person, but really we're fighting the fact that we feel like we're not good enough in some fashion, mm. if we're really mm. honest with ourselves, right? Our self is at risk, right? And to allow ourselves to be bathed in compassion, to be bathed in love and to see ourselves as worthy, as lovable, as, as beloved, allows us to show up completely differently to the other person. Mm. Now the other person isn't some evil person. It's a broken person who's also worthy of love and, and compassion. And it, I think it changes the nature of the conversation. Now, does your book dive into this to, with tools to help people do this? Yeah. Yeah, it does. It does. Cool. That's really, um, yeah, that's the intention of the book. There's, there's a second one in my imagination, which which takes the conversation to a slightly different place. But in this book, what I'm trying to explore is, A, how is it that we feel like our self is at risk? So that first chapter is about the, diff the shift from disagreement into conflict. And then from there on, it's, well, once we've, our self is at risk, well, how do we deal? First, how do we understand that? And then secondly, how do we deal with that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I'll show personally that, you know, my entire life, I've had a problem with defensiveness. You know, it's like, I can't stand it if I'm not right. <laughs> you know, and, and as much as I try in some situations, you know, I, I don't approach it correctly. I don't approach the situation correctly because of that immediate tendency to try to show that I'm right. <laughs> so um, do you have any advice for me? <laughs> so, so in contemplative spirituality, the question would be, what does the, where does the need to be right come from? And, and I don't know. Right? It's an eight. It's an eight. What, it's an eight. That's right. Fair enough. Okay. So it's an eight. <laughs> so um, then what would be the what would be the practice that allows you to hold the need to be right in one hand and the permission to wait before you need to be right in the other hand? Right? Like that would be um, or how do you hold yourself with compassion? How do you hold the need to be right with compassion? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The temptation, I think, is to go to the place of, okay, Brian, stop needing to be right, fix yourself. But really what you're doing then is just kind of um, like, what's that? Whipping yourself, right? I'm wrong. I shouldn't be right all the time. I, should, I shouldn't be defensive all the time. Contemplative spirituality is kind of allows you to be nonviolent with yourself. Hmm. So many of us, when we want to change, we're like, all right, I'm going to change. And then we end up almost doing violence to ourselves in the effort to be different. And a contemplative approach to life says, no, let's just accept you exactly as you are, including with you, this whole need to be right. Let's just accept all of that. 
And let's just honor that because that serves you in some capacity that hasn't been a gift for you. It's been a superpower. <laughs> Every gift has a negative. <laughs> yeah, power. yeah. So, but so let's just let's just rem- let's just hold with grace and recognize the gifts and recognize the compulsions and hold those with compassion. And once we've held that compulsion with compassion, I think we can start to let go of the compulsion. <laughs> Well, I've had some success at that, but not uh, not as much as I would like. Let me put it that way. Fair enough. Yeah. So. We're all on a journey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so another thing you talk about in the book that I, I don't understand this term well either is non-resistance to self. Right. What does that mean? Well, it's in in the book. I actually talk about it as the non-violent non-resistance to the self. Uh, and what I'm, and it, it connects to what we've been talking about. And the idea here is that, um, how do we make space? I was, I was listening to Jack Cornfield um, some months ago, and he talked about one of the people, when we, he was talking about forgiveness. And one of the things that he said is, we have to sometimes forgive ourselves for being in a place where we are not ready to forgive the other. And to allow ourselves to be in the place of non-forgiving and to forgive ourselves for being in a place of non-forgiving rather than needing to force ourselves to be forgiving. Does that make sense? And the, what I'm driving at, uh, this came out as a, as a, was a conversation with a friend of mine. We were walking along the Camino um, some years ago and, and she was talking about wrestling with some tough stuff. And, and I observed this tendency, not only in her, but in so many of us, to get down on ourselves. So let's say, for example, let's play this out again, Brian. Let's say that you and I have had a conflict, and and I'm, and I'm, I'm still mad about it. Um, and we've had this great resolution, and I should be free to be normal with you again, but it's still sticking with me, and I'm still feeling awkward around you. Nonviolent, non-resistance to self is to say, rather than getting mad at myself, which would be violence, and rather than saying stop, which is resistance. Is to say, I accept with compassion that I'm still feeling awkward. I, ex- I hold myself with self-compassion. I hold myself gently with self-compassion. See, nonviolence is the gentle part. Non-resistance is the acceptance part. Hmm. And, and, and one of the things that I've learned, that so many of us have these feelings that emerge, and then we respond out of those feelings, and then we have conflict, right? I'm mad at you. I don't even know that I'm mad at you. I just respond. Only later do I kind of put it together. It's like, oh, I guess I was mad at him, right? It just stuff just emerges. And in a contemplative res- approach to this work, to dealing with conflict and communication is to allow ourselves, to go to that place of allowing. I allow myself to feel my awkwardness or I allow myself to feel that I'm really distressed by this relationship or I allow myself to feel my anger, my pain, whatever it is. And where in my body am I feeling that pain? Just go there and just spend time and not rush it. Just really allow ourselves to go there and allow ourselves to feel it. And then from there, go to the place of acceptance. I accept that I'm feeling this pain. So the allow is the nonviolence. The accept is the non-resistance to ourselves and to what's going on inside of us. <laughs> and once we can do that, we can begin to release it and then to rest. And see, hmm. I find these four words, allow, accept, release, rest. And for people of faith, you can re- we can release into God's care. If you're not of faith, you can release to the universe. It doesn't really matter. But it's the sense that we're releasing to an energy that's greater than ourselves. And from there, we can rest in self-compassion, rest in God's care. It's not a quick journey. It's Easier a- said than done, right? Is it- <laughs> it's a little thing, you know. <laughs> if, it's, if it's been a journey, you might stay with allow for a couple of weeks, right? Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. So another concept that you talk about is the true and false self. And you actually talk about kind of three different states, so to speak. Can you, can you explain that to us? So um, Thomas Merton talks about the true and false self. Uh, Richard Rohr does and other people as well. And they, they have made a huge contribution um, to understanding spirituality. I take that and define it a little bit differently. And it's in my research as I was working with this material, I found myself as I was re- reading both Rohr and Merton, I found them struggling with how to define the false self, the true Mm. self they could define, but the false self, well, it's good, it's necessary, but it's wrong and it's not wrong. It's good, it's necessary, (laughs) but wrong. It kept doing the same. And I found myself inclined to divide the two 
uh, false self into two categories. So we have the what they call the true self, which I call the deeper self. And the deeper self is where is the life breath of God. You know, it's is um, for from a Jewish perspective from the Old Testament, it's the life breath of God breathing in and through us. It's the presence of God within us. It's divinity within us, if you will. Um, and so that's the the deeper self. And the deeper self in me is the same deeper self in you, because it's the breath of God that's the same in you and in me. And you know, that's not divided. So there's something that's true about me and true about you, which is the exact same truth, which I mm. think is quite provocative. But you've got a container that you were given to wear at your birth. I've got a container that I was wearing, given to wear at my birth. That includes my skill sets. It includes my weaknesses, like my my limitations. Um, it includes, uh, you know, my foundational human needs, the, just the needs that are woven into our identities. It includes the tradition into which I was born. Um, all of that stuff. Those containers... I mean, we were given these containers to step into at our birth, and they are not bad. They are not. What I say in the book is they're neither good nor bad. They just are. Um, and we can honor them for being just are, for being just what they are. Then we have, what, and what I argue in the book, and this is where I think it's a bit of a diversion from Merton and so forth, is that the deeper self and the descriptive self are in a perpetual dance with one another, like a double helix. And there, you know, you are, without your deeper self, you have no breath. Without your container, without your descriptive self, you have no body. And you need these two to be in perpetual dance with one another. But as Christians, we have a, fo- we have a picture of this. We have a forerunner, and that's Jesus. Because the the Jesus, the human form of Jesus is the descriptive self. The life breath of God breathing in and through him is the, is the deeper divinity, div, the deeper self, the, the divine within. And he's always working at the both end of those two. And I think we are meant to do the same. Now, when we attach ourselves to our descriptors, when I'm attached to this skill set of mine and I, it has to be this way, or we might be attached to our low self-esteem. I encounter people who are deeply attached to their weaknesses, are deeply attached to my pain story. Then we fall into our defended self, mm-hmm. what Merton would call the false self, which is it. You know all the ways in which we get ourselves. I'm not good, and like all the way the shame, the ego, and all of that stuff. That's the defended self. Um, that third layer. And I find that by having these three layers, it allows us to claim. See, I find with, with the two, when we have only the two selves, um, as per Merton, we don't really have permission to celebrate the container we've been given to wear, our skill set. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you have, a unique, you have a unique gifting. If I look at my three children, they each have a unique gifting and they're not the same, right? Um, We each have this unique gifting, which I think we're meant to celebrate and we're meant to enliven it with the life breath that we've been given. So all of that is delightfully worthy. And then we do have this inclination to fall into that defended self. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. By allowing these two to be the, the goodness of the container and the goodness of the breath, to allow those to be in dance with one another, I think it changes a lot. I think it is. I think that's a very valuable distinction. And it's re- very helpful for me, you know, you know, to think of things that way. And, you know, I'm thinking even about our differences, right? So, for example, when you think about equity work, uh, we know that part of what gets us in trouble is when we think, oh, we're all just the same. We're all just the life breath. Of-, and we try to minimize the differences about the containers we've been given to wear, which means that I don't see the unique di- way in which you're different than me which means that I don't get to recognize the way society mm-hmm. forms you differently than me, which means that I can be invisible or I can sure, be unconscious sure. privilege. Wow. That's a powerful distinction just that alone. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. It's a pretty big concept. It's I've got a whole chapter on it. I know it's a bit complex, but I, for me, it feels like it's, it's really pivotal in terms of dealing with conflict because so for example, and then another piece of it is where do I put my center? Do I put my center in one of my characteristics or do I put my center in the life breath? If I put my center in one of the characteristics and you, um, let's pretend my characteristic is here in this hand, and you say something negative to me about this, I must defend myself to stay alive. But if I put my center here in the life breath of God coursing through me, you can say anything you want about this characteristic. My life is not at risk. 
And that allows me to be more reflective in terms of how I respond to you. You can say all you want about that. I'm not at risk. And when I'm not at risk, I can be relating to you in a way that's more generative, more gracious. Mm -hmm. How do you avoid the kind of egotistical fallout of claiming to be centered in the divine? Right? <laughs> you, you know what I mean? You can, view, you, you can take it on that viewpoint that you just described. But then I could also envision myself being defensive about that, <laughs> you know, as I claim that, so to speak. You know what I mean? Does that make any sense? Yeah, it does. It does. So in a way, what you're asking, what are the characteristics of centering? And I think one of the characteristics is profound humility. Mm. Uh, one of my teachers is um, James Finley. And one of the things that he says is if it's a race between senility and perfect centering, if that were to be a race, and I'm paraphrasing now, he said, if that were to be a race, you can be assured, be assured that senility would win. We never, we're never fully there. Mm -hmm, we're mm -hmm. always on a journey. And I think mm -hmm. assuming that we're fully there, is probably an indicator that you're not. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Interesting, okay. wow. So um, what also in the book, you talk about the um, use of spiritual discipline Mm -hmm. as it relates to conflict um, mediation and, and, and transformation. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So, you know, if I think about um, getting ready for, well, just even dealing with conflict. So something happens, um, a conflict happens and it bowls us over. You know, what are the, di what are the spiritual disciplines that I can lean into in order to, reground my like so when i get bowled over i'm off you know I'm, I'm, i've been unmoored so how do i reground myself how do i show up to you in a way that is grounded and so there are spiritual disciplines i think that we can use to support that um one of them so i have a whole list of them here in the book one of them for example is um the invitation to well there's one that i've identified already the invitation to go to a place of um of meditation, um, centering prayer, right? Or, or meditation either way. I mean, there's lots of different forms of silent meditation. Um, this mantra of allow, accept, release, rest. There's a mantra there. I often work with my clients on to helping them to come up with a mantra to mm. accompany them mm. over several weeks and to take mm. it like medicine kind of nonstop because part of what happens is, so let me take a step back. When we are practicing um, contemplative prayer or when we're centering prayer or um, meditation, what we're trying to do is come to a place of inner silence and to allow the mind to come to rest so that we can. And as we do that, we are letting go of our ego attachments. We're letting go of our shame. We're coming into silence, right? That's nice. And I think it's important. It's like going to the gym for the soul and it grounds me for the rest of the week or the rest of the day. The problem is that as the day happens, my mind will start to twist again and will start to go racing, especially if I've got something to think about, like a conflict that's causing me some uh, this unease. So in those situations, I've worked with people to come up with a mantra that whenever the mind goes to, whenever the mind goes wild on, or just goes to that cycle, what's the mantra that brings me back to mm -hmm. So, So there's the, you know, you do your 20 minute sit, but then when you're not in your in your silence in your prayer then how do you use these mantras to come back to center using mantras to come back to center um so that would be those are two um central pieces of the spiritual <clears throat> there are others in there like there's quite a number of them i think um i could say more if you want no no I mean, that's very helpful i mean i, I think it sounds great I'll, I'll let people buy the book to learn <laughs> to learn the rest so um if, if you had to summarize what one thing that you'd like people to take away from a book, what would that be? One thing is that you are worthy, you are beautiful, and you are beloved. Hmm. And if you can allow yourself to just sit with those three words, those three phrases for a while, you are worthy, you are beautiful, and you are beloved. And just really breathe into those three phrases. Sit with them. Hmm. And in my belief, everything else will begin to change. Nice, nice. Yeah. So um, the, the next question I always like to ask folks is, um, 
are there any future books that you can talk about or is it too early to you know discuss well, anything sure. on that front? sure I, there is a second book that i'd like to write good um, in my when i was doing my the, thesis i was working on a particular conclusion or i i I mean, I had three different conclusions to my thesis. This book explores one of those conclusions. I see. And there's a second conclusion. Um, I spent a lot of time in the last, well, over since 20, March of 2020, um, supporting groups through polarized conversations. And uh, there's something about polarized conversations that I would like to explore in the second book. And it's connected to contemplative spirituality. Good, good. So what I found when I was, um, the reason I did my thesis in the first place was I saw contemplatives talking about both and thinking, but they were talking about it in kind of ephemeral ways. Like they were talking about it, but it didn't have hooks very well for people. Whereas in the world of conflict resolution, we, we have models, we can draw it out for you. We have pictures on how both and thinking works. And so the reason I did my thesis is I wanted to put together what contemplatives were saying about both and thinking and what conflict people were saying about both and thinking instead of either or thinking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, that was that was where I started my thesis. It is one of the conclusions I'd like to spend some time writing about. This book is a conclusion I wasn't expecting. Hmm. And this is the conclusion of the three cells versus the two cells, um, which is sort of the heart of this book. And then it expands from there. So the next book um, that I'm hoping to write is on polarized thinking and transforming polarized. Thinking. I think that that's so needed. I mean, in today's world. So I, really encourage you to do that <laughs> thank you yeah yeah so, so again um the title of of the of the new book that just came out the space between is conversations about transforming conflict and you can uh, find out more about the book and about betty at bettyprees.ca again that's b-e-t-t-y-p-r-i-e-s.ca so betty thank you so much for sharing your work with us and uh, i'm very excited about it i'm going to make sure i get a copy and read it so <laughs> so thank you so much for all that work thanks brian much appreciated <laughs>